Good morning. It is so good to see each of you here on this not quite so sunny but warmish day. That's we look forward to enjoying the the warmth. Although I've got a feeling it's probably going to get cold again before uh, the true warmth gets here. But uh, again, so wonderful to be able to share together. It's so good to have Mary Ellen with us today. And it'll be great when we're able to have Mike and Julia back with us. And uh, we continue uh, to pray uh, as God continues to work. And that's the way it goes. And I know that each of us have our own prayer requests, those things that are part of our heart and our lives and people that we know that just need to have a touch from God, whether it's healing or a spiritual awakening. So we just want to lift all of those up before uh, the Lord this day and present it uh, before Him. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to be here on this day, to share in fellowship and in worship and in spending time studying your word. I pray, Father, that as we continue to walk through the book of Galatians, that you will open to our hearts and to our minds those things that meet our needs where we are in our spiritual walk. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we started last week in, in our series in the book of Galatians, and the series title uh, is going to be Broken by His Cross, Healed by His Spirit. And uh, last week we looked at the cross that delivers this was uh, the opening greeting remarks from Paul. What I find interesting in the book of Galatians, it is the only book that Paul wrote that does not have nice things to say. <laughs> he, he always starts out after he has his greeting, he always says, well, it's so wonderful you're doing this, and it's great that you're doing that, and so on. He does not do that in the book of Galatians because of the seriousness of the situation. Now, I showed you a map last week. It, it basically is uh, from central to uh, western Turkey is where uh, Galatia and the churches of Galatia are located. And uh, so there's a lot going on there. They, the reason it's called Galatia is that uh, the Gauls came and left their homeland, came and conquered in this area, lived in this area. And then the, they fought the Romans and lost and, and became under their uh, control. And they had an opportunity then through Paul's missionary journeys to have churches open and people come to know Christ as Savior. Paul's back at Antioch and he gets word probably only a year or so after he left that things had changed. Things were different. And he's very astonished, very upset about what has taken place there. And so after his initial uh, greeting, he moves into immediately going after them. Now I need to have some definitions. I love definitions. And I hope that if you have the opportunity to write down the definitions or if you have the notes, then you'll have the definitions. But it's important for us to understand some things. First off, the definition of the gospel. All right. The word in the Greek is euangelon, and it essentially and very simply means good tidings. It was not a word that was used often in Greek literature, but there were some writings 
that were considered gospels. Now, a gospel, besides being a good tiding, was a written document which held life-changing possibilities. And you could proclaim the content of a gospel before it was written. There were several gospels that were written during the first uh, few centuries after the birth of Christ. And there were some even way before uh, in the times of, of Plato and that group uh, that was through there. So this document would be passed around and if you read it, it had life-changing possibilities. Today, you might uh, have read a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay? Basically, that's a gospel. All right? When you, when you read that document, that book, it has life-changing possibilities. It helps to, to change your life. The term, however, became seriously applied to the Bible because that's where its main focus was in, early, in, the, in the Greek literature, in the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Mark, Luke, John. So that's something that's important for us to understand as far as the term gospel is concerned. Then I want to give you a couple other definitions. Theology. It's what a scholar thinks God said and is able to get others to follow and agree. Doctrine is what God said. Now, many, many Many years ago, in the earlier part of my ministry, I, I made this statement at a pastor's conference that there's a difference between doctrine and theology. And there were several of the pastors that were scratching their head having a hard time, you know, well, how can there be a difference between doctrine and theology? You know, how would we know what doctrine is if we didn't have theology? So I said, all right, let me give you a definition, and I'm, let me give you an example, and I'll give you the same example I gave them. All right? Let's take the doctrine of salvation. The Bible says, God says, that to be saved, you need to repent of your sin, you need to believe in the gift of salvation through Jesus on the cross as your only way of salvation, and surrender to it. All right, that's what God says. But there's a theology, many theologies of salvation. There are those that say that salvation is by faith alone. Others say it's by faith plus works. Others say that you're elected to it and you don't have a choice. Others say it's completely free will. Some say it's universalism. That is that everybody is going to go to heaven. We're all following uh, the path that's going to lead us there. Just, you know different directions, to different roads of finding our way there. Now, it's easier to see the difference now between what God said and what individuals think God said. All right? Now, some of these theologies are harmless in that regardless of which one you pick or believe, it's you know, not a big deal. Some of them do great harm. Universalism. That does great harm. There's a lot of people who say, well, you know, if I'm just religious and I believe in God and I want to love everybody and I want everybody to love me and we're just going to live this earth the best way we can and, you know, we're, we're all going to end up. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, uh, this or that or, you know, this faith or that faith. We're all, we're all going to get there. We're all, the names of God, we're all still God and so on and so on. That's very harmful. Because obviously that's untrue. There's only one way to heaven through Christ. So that that's pretty harmful. Uh, faith plus works can be harmful. If you believe that you accept Christ as Savior and that gets you in the door, but to keep you in the door you have to have good works, that you can lose your salvation, that, that can be harmful. Uh, as my... Uh, Uncle Leon used to say, 
if you act like you should, you wouldn't lose it even if you could. So I kind of kind of like uh, that that aspect uh, of it. But uh, your pastor believes very strongly in eternal salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You can abuse it, you can misuse it, but you can't lose it if it's truly yours. Now, the next definition is the term heresy. Heresy is the perversion of doctrine masked as acceptable theology. Okay? So we have heresies that are out there. Uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, they pervert the doctrines of Scripture, but they mask it as acceptable theology. And so it's, it, those are the things that and literally Paul is dealing with a heresy. Right? Now he's not going to define it just yet. Later in the book he'll define this heresy as those Jews who had accepted Christ as their Messiah and followed Paul wherever he went to the Gentile churches and said, look, Paul gave you the truth, and that's, you know, we don't want to take anything away from that, but he didn't give you all the truth. And all the truth is that you have to become Jews in order to be a part of the kingdom. And in order to become Jews, you have to be circumcised, and you have to obey the law, and so on and so on. And that infiltrated the church. All the churches of Galatia were being infiltrated by this, and then Paul was very upset because he couldn't be there all the time and they would just come in in groups after he left and mess everything up and caused a lot of problems. So he's very going to be very strong uh, in what he has to say about this situation. Okay, so the truth that underlines uh, Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 10, that's what we're looking at today, is that there is only one gospel. Period. Growing up out of this truth are three statements which are very crucial for us to hear and believe because nothing has happened to change them between Paul's day and ours. First one is this. There's only one gospel and that it is complete without variation. Only one. Oh, well, you just got done saying there were other... Yes, there are other written documents that had life-changing possibilities, but there's only one gospel that saves you. There's only one gospel that gets you into heaven. There's only one gospel that makes you a part of the family of God. Period. Okay? The second is that it's strange and astonishing when someone hears the gospel and receives the truth of the gospel and then walks away from it. And so, to Paul, it would... He was so astonished. He said, I, I can't understand how you could do that. When you heard it, when you knew it, when you experienced it, and now you've walked away from it. The third is that those who reject or pervert and teach that perversion as acceptable theology are under a curse. That is, God's judgment and wrath. Now, the Greek word anathema, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later in the message, but the Greek word anathema, as far as the New Testament is concerned, Paul is, is about the only one who used the word. It's six times, six times. One time in Acts, and five times in Paul's epistles. And the one time that it's written in Acts, it refers to Paul. So, it, it all surrounds him in this aspect. And I'll, I'll give you uh, some more information about that because we want to understand exactly what that term anathema means because Paul is, is calling that down on these who are perverting the gospel. God's judgment and wrath. So it's kind of important to know what the gospel is since I'm up here talking about the fact that there's only one what is that gospel? Well, it's that Jesus is God. That's, that's point number one. 
that he's God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, that's number two, that he was birthed into humanity, he was born a virgin, lived without sin, died on a cross, shedding his blood to pay for our sin, rose again on the third day, and is coming back for us. That's the gospel. Okay? Now there's, you know, those, those are the one, two, three, four, five, sixes, but there's all kinds of subpoints that go, you know, throughout that. But that's basically what the gospel is. And any variation of that is wrong. Okay? That's it. That's how it happens. That's what it is. We need to understand that Jesus is God, not just a human being who was godly. We need to understand that He's God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That He was born of a virgin. That He lived without sin. If He had sinned, He would have had to die for His own sin. Well, how did he live without sin? Well, because he was 100% man and 100% God. Not 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% God and 100% man. He felt the same things that you and I felt. He experienced the same types of temptations that you and I have experienced. He went through all of those things, but yet was without sin. How was he able to do that? Because he was God. How is he able to experience? Because he was man. He was fully human and fully God. He came here for that one specific purpose, to live that sin sinless life so that he could die on a cross and pay for our sin because we're sinful human beings. All right. Our response to that gospel is to repent of our sin accept the payment of the shed blood of Christ as the only way of salvation and surrender our lives to Him. That's what salvation is. Now, a strange paradox that defies understanding as far as I'm concerned is that you can be deeply religious and not saved while others can be deeply rebellious and truly saved. That's just, that doesn't make any sense to me. But it's true. It, it's the way God has allowed things to be. He's, he's allowed us to be human. <laughs> he, he's allowed us to be sinners saved by grace. Paul made the statement, I'm the chief of sinners, and yet I'm saved. I fully am a follower of Jesus Christ, yet I'm a sinner saved by grace. And so we need to understand that there are those whom we know who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior and were truly saved but live in rebellion. They can misuse it and abuse it but not lose it. That's a tough one. And then there are those that we know. I had a friend in, in uh, high school and, and, and after high school. And his name was Bill. And Bill and his family, they were just good people. I mean, they were just genuinely good people. If you've ever known people who are just genuinely good people, they were just good people. They didn't do this, they didn't do that, they didn't go here, they didn't go there, they were always helpful, they were yeah. and they and never saw a need to become religious. It took Bill a lot of years to come to the point of realizing that he was a sinner and that he needed to be saved by grace. Because he was just a good person. He says, I, he says, I can understand why people who are sinners need to come to God, but you know, mom and dad, we're just good people. Finally, in the end, after many, many years, the whole family came to Christ, but it was it was, it was tough going. I used to invite Bill to, to our youth group all the time. Yeah, that's great. He, he played the guitar. He played the guitar with me. And, and Yes, back in the day when my hands worked, I used to play the guitar. And we would all be a part of that, and it was all great and all wonderful. 
but it took a long time. He finally did come to know Christ as Savior, but boy, it was tough going for him to understand his need for that. So, Paul says in verse 6, I marvel, actually the word is astonished, I'm astonished that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. I'm just absolutely astonished that you're turning away from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Paul is completely astonished that the Galatian churches had walked away from the gospel he taught them and were so soon accepting a different gospel, which he's going to point out in the next verse, is not a gospel at all. It, it wasn't good news. It wasn't good tidings that these Judaizers came into these churches and say, oh, you've got to be circumcised. That's not good tidings. <laughs> no. That you have to keep the law. You have to become Jews. No, that was not good news at all. He says, that's not a gospel. It's not even a good gospel. In verse 7, he says, which is not another. He makes that clear. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So this verse is very clear. There is no other gospel than the one he preached to them and which they received. To be sure, as verses 6 and 7 make plain, there are people presenting their ideas as gospel, but these are perversions. It's why it's really important that we understand the Word of God. It, it, it's part of the burden of, of being a pastor in presenting God's Word so that over the time, over the years, you learn what God says. I used to think it was important to point out all the wrong things in these other groups until I realized all you really need to do is know the truth. And as long as I keep presenting the truth of God's word, when all this stuff that's a lie comes up against you, you can go, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what God says. And so I spend my time teaching what the word of God says. And in that way, you are filled with the truth. And when all that stuff happens, and it does, because it's out there, punches of it, you know, all kinds of variations, you're able to say, you know what, that's not what it says. And so I'm not going to follow that. I'm not going to believe that. Paul implicates the ones presenting the perversion of the gospel as those from within the church who claim to be brothers in Christ. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, Paul warns the church at Ephesus, in this is what he says, And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. He said, we're, we're not talking about different religions and foreign aspects coming into the church. We're, we're talking about people who go to church or say that they're brothers and sisters in Christ and are presenting a perverted theology, perverting the doctrine of God, masking it as acceptable theology. Well, how are you going to know if that's right or wrong? Because you learn what the truth of the Word of God is. And if it goes against the truth of the Word of God, then you go, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not right. Now, the implications of this text for our day are very important. The text is a radical and forthright denial of pluralism or universalism, which says that we are all on different roads to heaven, but our destination is the same. A lot of religious people out there. Really, there are. A lot of people believe in a God, believe in a religious way of being. And some are even much more committed to their faith than true believers are to theirs. 
They give up time in their lives. They, you know, they go around knocking on doors. They, they do all kinds of things. They will, they will do that because that's how they believe they're going to be saved. It's important for us to understand these things. This form of universalism is prevalent in our society. But there is no biblical universalism. There is no biblical teaching that a person can go on rejecting the gospel of Christ and still be saved. None. Okay? Kind of important. We, we kind of have this, this feeling, you know, well, you know, I really don't want to witness to this person. They're kind of religious. They go to that church. They, you know, they... They, they believe, you know, they're part of the kingdom hall, or they're part of this, or they're part of that. They're, you know, uh, they, they, they believe in the love of God and loving people and doing good things. And I'm, Hey, I'm sorry, but if they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and they don't believe that He's God Himself who died on the cross to pay for our sin, if they have not re repented and asked Him to be their Savior and surrendered their life to Him, they're not saved. They're just religious. Okay. Now there are other religions, obviously, besides Christianity. There are other leaders besides Jesus. But there's no other gospel, no other way of salvation. Jesus said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the light. And no man, no one, comes to the Father but by me. Jesus made that extremely clear. Nobody. No exceptions. No negotiations. Period. Galatians is one of the best books in the Bible for helping us to refine and clarify what the heart of the gospel is, which can't be replaced or altered. This has become a tragic pattern in churches and in history. One gospel. That's it. Period. You say, boy, that's awful narrow-minded. <laughs> yeah. But see, Jesus understood how simple we really were. And that when he, if you had too many options, you wouldn't know the right one to pick. <laughs> and you'd usually pick the wrong one. So he said, I'm only going to give you one option. Period. Okay? Just one. So the second thing then is why is it astonishing that someone turns away from the gospel to a perverted gospel? Reason? Because they are turning away from the God who called them and they heard the call. That's astonishing. They heard the call. But they're walking away. They're not just changing their doctrinal position from pre-trib to post-trib. You know, they're, not, they're not changing a doctrinal position they are rejecting God himself after they believed in him. Now the second reason turning to a different gospel is astonishing is that it is turning away from grace. Galatians 5.4, Paul describes what is happening like this. This is what he says. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from from grace. Now, th this, this term fallen from grace has kind of been misused over the years. Uh, the idea that Paul's presenting here is that you have chosen a different way to get saved. Instead of being saved by grace, you've accepted the idea that you can be saved by keeping the law. All right? Intense legalism. He's not talking about a believer who has fallen from grace and somehow lost their salvation. Now it's just that you're believing that your salvation is grounded in the law, not in the grace of God. Important to understand there. Paul is simply stunned that so soon after his beautiful portrayal of Christ crucified for their sin, they would begin to turn to another gospel, which wasn't a gospel at all. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. 
You don't need to believe in the blood of Christ. You need to believe in the blood of sacrifices to the obedience of the law. Really? Yeah, you don't, you don't need that. I mean, yeah, Paul had some truth, but the real truth is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, and you've got to become Jews. Oh, we didn't know that. And they turned to that, and they accepted that. It would be kind of like, let's see, who can, who can we pick on? This? I, I think we might as well pick on Phil and Mary Ellen. Right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take Phil and Mary Ellen, and we're going to send them to Oklahoma. Okay? We're going to pay their way to Oklahoma, and they're going to spend two years in Oklahoma starting churches. Okay? They're going to go all over the state of Oklahoma, and they're going to start churches. And they're going to disciple them, and they're going to teach them, and they're going to train them, and they're going to set up leaders in these churches. And in those two years, they managed to start ten churches. And those churches were growing and people were coming in and then they came back. They came back here to report all that had taken place. And after they were here and back home with us for another year or so, they get a letter. And in the letter, it basically says, Phil, Mary Ellen, thank you so much for all that you shared with us. But you know what? You only gave us part of the truth. There was a whole group of people that came into our churches that shared with us a new vision of the truth of God. And we're following that now. Woo. Can you imagine? You guys would be really upset. You'd be on the next plane out there. You know? Wait a minute, you guys can't do that. That's not the truth. That's a perversion of the truth. You've got to get it right. That's exactly what Paul is experiencing here. It's what he's going through. He says, you're foolish. Who's bewitched you? I showed you who Jesus was and him crucified and resurrected. So this news is so astonishing to Paul that he begins a harsh rebuke to the leaders of this perversion and a plea to the people to return to the truth. So here's what he says. But even if we, that is apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Greek word is anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Anathema. All right, I told you I'd let you know a little more about what this word anathema is about. It was used very seldom, as I said, in, within the Greek culture. And even in the New Testament, it's only Paul that really uses the word. And the reason that Paul uses the word is because Paul was a student of the Old Testament. He was, if you will, a doctor of Old Testament studies. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel, and one of the greatest rabbis in Jewish history. There were six Jewish rabbis that the Jews look at as being the greatest. Gamaliel was one of them. Paul studied under him and knew the Old Testament, understood the Old Testament. The word, the Greek word, anathema, actually comes from, or is a variant from, the Hebrew word, cherem. And way back in the beginning, back in, in, in Leviticus, the word itself, cherem, meant if you devoted something to God. Say you were a sheep herder and you devoted half of your herd to God. And then you passed away. Your offspring could not sell the part that was devoted to God. It had to be killed. 
it was considered unredeemable. Now that's an important part of this word. Unredeemable. Had to die. Okay? A little later on, from the time you get to Joshua's time, the word had kind of grown a little bit. Now it was being applied to idols that were destroyed. All the idols that were destroyed within Israel were, were cherem. Okay? And then, by the time the Old Testament was about wrapped up, the word generally was understood as being under God's disfavor. Under God's disfavor. So it went from being unredeemable and must die to the destruction of idols to being under God's disfavor. Paul takes that and brings it into the Greek understanding. In fact, we, the word anathema is exactly the Greek word. It's what we call transliteration. It's not really translated. It's just you take the Greek letters, the Greek words, and you bring it into English, and you have the word anathema. But it means being under a great curse, under God's fury, wrath, and judgment. So Paul is going to bring this rebuke upon these who have perverted the gospel of Christ. Okay. So, Paul makes two things clear. No one, not even an angel, that's, you know, pretty high up there, from heaven, nor an apostle is exempt, exempt from this rebuke. The rebuke is to be anathema or a great curse. When a person is anathema, he's cut off from Christ, Romans 9.3 and doomed to eternal punishment. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul said that those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, notice what he says, shall suffer the punishment of eternal destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. He uses the word anathema. So that's the best way that I can explain it. This is what Paul says suffer punishment of eternal destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from His glory. Anathema. And so he says, for all of you who are doing this, anathema, cursed by God under the fury and wrath and punishment of God. Whew. Okay. <laughs> so the reason... This curse abides on anyone who rejects the gospel and not just the false teachers in these verses is that Paul uses the same word in 1 Corinthians. He says, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be anathema. In today's evangelical Christianity, there is a prevalent thought that people who are religious in a variety of ways are probably saved and are just following a different path. What Paul is telling us is that there is no other path that leads to salvation. And that those who follow that other path or teach another oath or path are on the road to destruction and anathema. The harshness of Paul's rebuke is intended to shock the believer and unbeliever back to reality and out of the blindness Satan has engineered. Paul is hoping that as the Galatians read this, that it, you know, is like a smack upside the head. It says, wake up! You're in the middle of, of absolute heresy. And you're on a path that's going to lead you to eternal destruction. May all those who are teaching this be accursed. And those who have come into your congregation who are following this and not the true gospel that you were taught, are going to be anathema. It's harsh. It's harsh. It's going to shock the believer and the unbeliever. Paul closes his rebuke with a statement meant to solidify his position and clarify his justified astonishment. That's what he says. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? 
For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Hmm. Interesting. That bondservant is actually a slave, doulos. In verses 8 and 9, Paul has just said something that will not win him many friends. It doesn't please most people to hear someone pronounce the sentence of eternal condemnation. I guess he didn't read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know? Paul, you know, not, not many people in the churches of Galatia are going to be too happy with what he just got done saying. Right? But he didn't care about that. He did not care about that. Paul must oppose the perversion of the gospel with all his might, whether it pleases people or not, for the glory of Christ and for the good of those who may yet believe the gospel. Paul is willing to speak unpleasant truth. You know, sometimes you and I have to speak unpleasant truth. Sometimes we have to do that. We should do it in love, but sometimes we have to do it because it's the truth, because it affects the eternal destination of those we're in contact. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray that we might learn from these things and, and understand from these passages how we must deal with life today in any perversion of the gospel. And yes, there are different churches and different directions and different theology, but may we always be pure in our doctrine. May it be exactly how you said it so that we may be obedient to your word. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.